So moving on to the next talk, our next speaker is Professor Joyant Murthy, and he did his PhD from John Hopkins University, and then he joined Indian Institute of Astrophysics. Now he is a senior professor in Indian Institute of Astrophysics. He was a research scientist at Department of Physics and Astronomy in John Hopkins University before, and he was the recipient of National Research Council Fellowship, NASA. His interest lies in space mission, interstellar dust, diffuse, radio, uh, diffuse radiation field, astronomical instrumentation, and also he is involved in balloon launching experiment in IIA. So if you have interest, so you can actually ask questions about balloon launching things, what he does. And he has interest in UV astronomy as well, on which you will be basically talking today. And his teaching, his interest lies in teaching as well, not only doing research. He is the president of Commission 21 of IAU. He is a member of Astronomical Society, Astronomical Society of India, American Astronomical Society. And he encourages students to participate in the citizen science. He is very much uh, interested in that. He loves it. So I request Professor Joyan Murthy to come over the stage and give his lectures. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll be uh, talking to you on ultraviolet astronomy. Now I actually have a, is there an echo? I, I probably speak too loudly. I, 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 this is actually a one hour talk, so the clear solution is for me to speak twice as fast. But uh, actually what I'll do is that uh, this, I, I'll try to, uh, to lean it a little more towards the topic that you're all working on, which is uh, the, the research at home. I'm at the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, and uh, I'll skip a lot of slides. What, uh, what I'll start with is to define what ultraviolet astronomy is. Now, very often when you think of astronomy or when you think of science, you think of specific topics. You think of stars, you think of galaxies, the planets, whatever it is. But what, uh, what I'm going to talk about is ultraviolet astronomy. And so this is uh, another way to classify astronomy. We have radio astronomy, optical astronomy, ultraviolet astronomy. Rather than classify by the objects that you study, you classify it by the wavelength regions that are being used. And this is very relevant when you're looking at doing, doing uh, data analysis with astronomy, with doing astronomy at home, because every wavelength region has different techniques. Now, the reason ultraviolet astronomy became big to start with is that uh, it, when, when, uh, when space astronomy started after, after the end of the space program in the 70s, they, after the end of the manned space program in the 70s, NASA was looking for a, for a theme for the, for, for, for the first satellites. And uh, they had a choice between X-ray astronomy, some of the first X rockets were X-ray rockets, and ultraviolet astronomy. And they chose to focus on ultraviolet astronomy. They chose to make the first, to make that initial thrust into ultraviolet astronomy because uh, they, they thought that uh, UV astronomy is, is reasonably close to optical. So many of the optical ast astronomers would understand uh, the, the, uh, the science and the physics of, of UV astronomy. And technically, UV astronomy is simpler than, than uh, X-rays. You can use many of the same optics, many of the same techniques as you use in optical astronomy. You just do it in space. So when I define UV astronomy, the, the ultraviolet is uh, usually the wavelength region between about uh, uh, I, I usually think in angstroms, but I know many people these days think in nanometers, so I'll, I'll say nanometers, but remember that I'm converting in my head. So from about 91, 90 nanometers, 91 nanometers, up to about 300 nanometers. The, and, and because these terms can be flexible, because there, there's uh, ambiguity, you might find some uh, overlap in the terms. So the extreme ultraviolet, there was a satellite called the Extreme Ultraviolet Explorer, and that was the wavelength region below 91 nanometers, 912 angstroms. Then the far ultraviolet, many, play, many people define it as the, as the wavelength region between 91 and 120 nanometers, and I'll explain why this, these specific wavelengths in, in just a bit. Uh, 
the NUV between 120 and 300 nanometers, and then the visible anything longer of 300 nanometers, anything longer of about 3,000 angstroms. And these different problems are defined by the technology. So the, the technology changes for each of these wavelength regions. Now, one of, the, uh, uh, one of the things that I would like to emphasize is that you, it is often, you, you often think that, that data are out there, you just download the data and then uh, it's just a series of numbers that you analyze, that you play with, you do things. And I have a lot of problem with, uh, uh, I'm, I'm starting to work with some computer science people, and I have a lot of pro trouble in speaking to them because they don't understand that the numbers are actual, are, are, the numbers represent reality. You, you, get the, you get numbers from the sky, and those numbers are actual physical numbers. They're just not columns in, a, in a, a spreadsheet. So when you talk to computer science people, very often they, they don't understand that. They just play with numbers, and they get all sorts of results, and those results may not make physical sense. So finally, this is what we do as, as astronomers. We have to make sure that what we see makes sense. You, you can get all sorts of results that just don't make sense. We have to see that they make sense. And so when you, un so, so my goal in this, in this talk, is to give you a little bit of the physical introduction to UV astronomy so that when you get UV data, you will understand where those data come from. Now, uh, one more thing before I, before I go on. The, I should also say that this whole idea of, of uh, public data access really came about from space astronomy, from, from NASA. Now, you get, uh, now most people have absorbed this philosophy to a greater or lesser extent, but really it came from space astronomy. The ground-based astronomy has always been very uh, uh, proprietary about their data. They take some data and they put it in their drawer and then they laugh it. They yeah, take some data, they put it in their drawer, and then they forget about it. Or, I mean, they don't forget about it, but they don't let anyone else look at it. But space data, you don't have the option of going to the telescope and observing another star. You have one satellite, and that you're not going to get another satellite to do the same thing. So the idea from the beginning was that all of the data would become publicly available. Now the philosophy, at least in NASA, is that uh, the public paid for the satellite. It's not paid for out of anyone's private purse. Uh, it's not the uh, Bill Gates satellite or anything like that. So therefore, the, the money, I mean the data, should belong to the public. So in principle, from any NASA mission, the data, as soon as they come out of the satellite, they're available to the public. Uh, you know, sometimes there's little quality issues and, and verification issues. So maybe not exactly from the moment it leaves the spacecraft. But in principle, all of the data are available. So when you get data, you, you will... Uh, so Kepler, Kepler was one of the exceptions. Kepler, they wanted to make sure that they had the uh, complete data set. So the data didn't become available immediately. It became available after three years or five years or whatever it was after they had gone through the first cut. But this public data access has come from space astronomy. All right, now uh, uh, let's see, let me go on. Skip a lot of this. Again, as I was saying, I can either speak twice as fast or I can skip a lot of slides. So now, when we look at, uh, at UV astronomy, we're looking at wavelengths below three, 300 uh, nanometers, 320 nanometers. Now, in order to do UV astronomy, you need to go above the atmosphere. The, the, most, uh, the most prominent reason for that is because of ozone. Ozone will block all of the UV from reaching the ground, so obviously you can't look for, from the ground up and see anything but also water vapor, uh, any nitrogen, all of these have lines that absorb in the UV. So you need to go out of the atmosphere. Now the mirrors are pretty standard mirrors. Uh, you, you have a standard mirror, which is a silvered mirror. It's glass with an aluminum coating. The only problem is that in the UV, you cannot use an aluminum coating. Or rather, you do use an aluminum coating, but you can't use a bare aluminum coating. 
in the optical, you have a telescope, you, ha you, you have a mirror, and all you do is you put an aluminum overcoating on that. But the trouble is that aluminum oxidizes immediately, and it oxidizes at very low levels of, of atmosphere. Even if you have 10 to the minus 5 tor, you, you will still get oxidation. And that oxidation is opaque in the ultraviolet. You can't use, if you get this aluminum oxide film on your mirrors, you won't observe anything in the ultraviolet. So you have to put an overcoating on your, uh, on your mirror. Typically, in this wavelength range, people use magnesium fluoride. It's just a very thin layer, maybe a few atoms thick layer of magnesium fluoride on top of your aluminum mirror. And uh, magnesium fluoride is actually a quite a sturdy substance. It's not very, uh, it's not very hydro, uh, hydroscopic. It doesn't absorb water. It's fairly resistant to scratches and so on. So it, it, it's not too bad. Now, because you have, because you're working in the UV, you have to uh, be very clean. In general, when you go to space, you, you always have a clean environment. But in the UV, you have to be specifically clean. And, uh, sorry, press the wrong button. And so you have, uh, you, you have people working in, in clean rooms. Typically, uh, if you look at a standard atmosphere, this, this room is probably uh, 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 7. A clean room might be something like uh, a thousand, uh, uh, might be a level of a thousand. And what that level is, is the number of particles per cubic something, cubic meter perhaps. So typically these levels, these are 10,000 or, or, uh, or maybe even 1,000. And the reason for that is, uh, is because any time you get hydrocarbons, those hydro, if you get hydrocarbons on the surface of your mirror, those are again opaque. Now there's two reasons for cleanliness. One is because of dust, and the other is because of these hydrocarbons. If you have dust on your mirrors, you can just blow that right off, and, and no, no long-term harm. But if you get hydrocarbons on your mirrors, those hydrocarbons, when they're exposed to UV light, they actually bond to your mirror. And there's no way you can get rid of them short of scraping off the whole mirror and, and starting all over again. So uh, this is different from the semiconductor industry where they also have even higher cleanliness requirements. They have cleanliness requirements of maybe one particle per whatever. But their reason is because of dust, because they're looking at circuits which are very, very tiny circuits, and you don't want little pieces of dust getting in and short-circuiting those, uh, those circuits. They don't care so much about hydrocarbons, but in the UV, we don't care that much about the dust. We don't want dust, but really the problem is the hydrocarbons. Uh, yeah, okay, now the, you have to be careful about the materials you use. In the optical, it's not such a big deal. There's lots of materials that are transparent. Glass is transparent 96% or something like that. So lots of things are transparent. In the UV, you're working, at much, you're working with a much more restricted set of materials, and the materials tend to transmit less. So in general, one minimizes the number of transmission elements. In fact, one minimizes the number of optical elements, and I'll, I'll show you why. But one minimizes the number of optical elements, and especially transmission elements. Where possible, you have reflections. Now, when you work in the, in the far UV, less than 120 nanometers, now you have to be even more careful because uh, there's almost nothing that transmits below 120 nanometers. You can't even use a magnesium fluoride overcoating because magnesium fluoride cuts out at about uh, 115 nanometers. You, so you have to use something like lithium fluoride or silicon carbide. And uh, when you use things like lithium fluoride, Lithium fluoride is now hydroscopic. It absorbs water. So now you have to not only keep it clean, you have to keep it free from all water. So the storage gets a lot more difficult. Because once you get over to the far UV, you don't have, uh, uh, you, the, there's very few materials that transmit in that wavelength range. So typically you have no transmitting optics at all. And in fact, even on your detector, you have an open window. So in the near UV, your detector is sealed, and I'll get to that. In the far UV, your detector is open to the atmosphere, which makes it that much more, uh, which makes your cleanliness and storage requirements 
that, more, that much more stringent. Let me actually back up a, a slide, a couple of slides, and let me uh, just tell you why these wavelength regions. So now 91 nanometers. Why 91 nanometers? That's the uh, ionization energy of hydrogen. There's so much hydrogen in the, in the interstellar medium, in, the, in space, that very hard to observe anything below 91 nanometers. The, the, the space is opaque, short word of 91 nanometers, until you get to the X-ray. So that's one cutoff. 91 to 120 nanometers, 120 nanometers, I just said, below 120 nanometers, you need open optics, you need open detectors, no transmitting optics. Coincidentally, 120 nanometers is also Lyman alpha, the N equals one transition of hydrogen, where, uh, where there's, there's so much hydrogen everywhere in our solar system, in our, in our atmosphere, that uh, if you're trying to observe anything near Lyman alpha, you have to account for that bright atmospheric and then interplanetary emission. Why, okay, so that's 120 nanometers. Why 300 nanometers? That starts to get into the visible. So the sun is a cool star, a G-type star. In fact, there's more G and M stars than there are hot O and B stars. So lots of visible light in the sky, including from our own sun. And so once you go longward of 300 nanometers into the visible, now suddenly you have to worry about the sun. Shortward of 300 nanometers, the sun is faint, and so you don't really have to worry about it. So that's the reason for these different wavelength bands. Okay. Now the detectors that we use in the UV are, are uh, we, we take advantage of the fact that we have macho photons. Every photon has a lot of energy. Because it's the UV, we also, as you get to shorter and shorter wavelengths, you also have fewer and fewer photons. Fewer and fewer photons, but each photon has more energy. If energy is hc over lambda, h nu. So more and more uh, energy. So, so we have a few photons, but very energetic photons. So we have what are called photon counting detectors. We try to de detect every single photon. In the optical, usually, and, and even more so in the IR and the radio, you don't actually detect each photon, rather you detect the total amount of energy that hits your detector. But we don't do that. We detect every photon. Now, because we detect every photon, and because there are not many photons, the statistics are Poissonian, the square root of n. What that means is that, uh, let's say I observe a star for, for 10 seconds. I might get 10 photons. If I observe that star for 100 seconds, I'll get 100 photons. Now, the signal to noise, that is the signal divided by the error, is the, is, is the square root of the number of photons. So if I have 10 photons, then the signal, the, the noise is three photons. That means 10 plus or minus three. If I have 100 photons, it's 100 plus or minus 10. So the signal to noise in the first case is 10 over three, which is three. Signal in the second case is 100 over 10, which is 10. So my signal to noise, that is the signal over the, my, my detection limits are, are I, I want to maximize my signal to noise. So the uh, longer I observe, obviously, the better the signal to noise. But my signal to noise only goes up as the square root of the time. So, so if I observe, if I observe for 10 seconds and I get a signal to noise of three, I have to observe for 100 seconds to get a signal to noise of uh, 10. I have to observe for 1,000 seconds to get a signal to noise of 30. For 10,000 seconds to get a signal to noise of uh, 100. So you see it goes up by, by the square root of the time. It's 86,000 seconds in a day. So you can clearly see that, that it's, you can't keep on extending in, infinitely. A million seconds is a substantial fraction of a year but it won't give you the correspondingly improved signal to noise. The other important thing about this is that because we're detecting every photon, and because these are zero noise detectors, again, unlike the visible radio and so on, we don't have any noise. 
these are uh, uh, the, these are high energy photons, so well over the thermal limit. You're not going to get any thermal noise, which is what drives a lot of the noise in the visible and IR and so on. So our detectors are essentially, not quite, but essentially zero noise. So that means that every photon that you detect is actually from the sky. So now I'm not limited to detecting one photon per second or one photon per frame or anything. If I detect one photon in 10,000 seconds, that may count as a detection. Well, it won't because that's one photon plus or minus one. So that's obviously not statistically significant. But let's say I detect 10 photons in 1,000 seconds. Now that's, uh, that gives me a signal to noise of three. So I don't, I can look much fainter. My dynamic range is much fainter, goes, goes to much greater uh, limits than, than uh, it would if I, if I were just an integrating detector. My, uh, okay, my, my picture didn't come through in this PDF, but that's okay. Now, the way that these detectors work is that uh, they're typically, uh, they, they have a photocathode. So they, they, the, from, from top to bottom, you start with the photocathode. Now, a photon comes and hits the photocathode. Obviously, if the photon has an energy greater than the work function, it will knock loose an electron. If it has a photon, if the energy is less than the work function, then, then it won't do anything. It won't knock loose an electron. So here we now have what are called solar blind detectors. So the sun has a million times, the sun is bright, and it's got a million times as many photons as any signal I might get from space. So I would like not to detect those photons from the sun. So if I choose the proper photocathode, if I choose a work pho photocathode with a work function, in the UV, I won't get any photons from the sun. So depending on the wavelength I, I want, I use something like cesium iodide, or rubidium telluride, or cesium telluride, or uh, any, any one of these. If I want to use, uh, uh, if I want to be sensitive to the visible, then I might use something like an S20. And this in fact, uh, well, I'll get to that. Okay, so now a, a photon comes and hits your photocathode, knocks loose an electron. Now that electron, is accelerated by about 200 volts into the surface of a microchannel plate. And what a microchannel plate is, is a, a set of, uh, yeah, this is a different one, is a, it won't show it, is a set of leaded pipes. And your electron, which hits the top of your microchannel plate, is accelerated through a, a voltage difference of about 5,000 volts to the bottom of that microchannel plate, to the bottom of these leaded pipes. So now this electron comes, comes tearing through your leaded pipes. It hits the pipe many times. Each time it hits the pipe, it knocks loose maybe, uh, maybe uh, 10 electrons, maybe 100 electrons. So by the time you get to the bottom, you've converted that one electron into anywhere from 100,000 to a million electrons. Now once it hits the bottom, now you have several ways of detecting it. One of the ways of doing it is the, is the way it's done in uh, AstroSat which is uh, to have a, a phosphor screen on the bottom. So you convert that burst of electrons into a burst of green light, and that green light is then detected by a, by a CCD. <coughs> this, has, uh, this has advantages and disadvantages. The main advantage is that it's uh, easy to get. The, the, you have all sorts of restrictions because of ITAR and uh, all sorts of other restrictions. A CCD-based detector is fairly easy to get. But uh, another type of detector is this kind of uh, micro, is, is this uh, anode detector, where you detect the burst of electrons directly. That burst of electrons, in this case, it hits a crossed wire. There's a long wire that runs like this, and there's a bunch of strips. So based on where it hits in here, you will get, uh, you can get the Y direction from, uh, from which strip it hits, and you get that X direction based on how long it takes to get uh, from here to here. It doesn't really matter. And this has a much higher uh, a cadence. You can, you're, you're much more sensitive. The other type of detector, that CCD detector, that's essentially the way that these night vision goggles work, the, the military, ex except instead of being sensitive to the UV, 
they're sensitive to the IR. So they convert IR photons into, into green photons that, uh, that you detect. All right, let me uh, take about five minutes more just to do a couple of calculations. What time did I start? I think I started at about three, right? One minute left, okay. So I'll just take a, a minute or so to, to go through a couple of calculations. Now, where this applies in, in, uh, in a lot of the stuff that you're doing is that there, are, there is now a, a complete UV survey of the sky in Galax that's available. Two bands, the FUV and the NUV. I don't have time to go into, into all the, the details of that. Uh, we also have uh, UVIT, from, from, which is part of the AstroSat payload. And eventually those data will also become public. But now what these do is that uh, they give you, they give you the, uh, uh, the counts in different wavelength bands. And based, on, based on, on the counts that you see in the different bands, you can actually do some signs. For instance, let's say you're looking at a star. Let, let's say you're looking at a star field. Now you know that the hotter the star, the more, the bluer its emission will be. So an O and B star, that will have a lot of, F, a lot of UV emission. So now if I look at a star field, I, I, look, I look at it in my FUV band, in my NUV band, and I can look at, it, look at it in the optical. So if I see a cool star, that cool star will show up in my optical bands, but not in my FUV or NUV. If I get a hot star, that'll show up in my UV bands, but then not in my optical bands. So here's a very... Uh, uh, simple way to do star classification. We've been doing some of that using, uh, using the Galax and SDSS bands, which gives us seven bands in order to, to do star classification and extinction. So let me uh, just, let me end there, but I will, uh, yeah. So now, let me, let me just say what you see in the UV and then I'll, I'll end. Now here, what we see in the UV are we, we see hot stars, so here is a, a, a globular cluster, Omega Centauri. When you look in the optical, what you see are basically cool stars, red stars. When you look in the UV, what you see are bright UV stars, which are young. So when you look in the UV, you're looking, you're looking at young stars. When you look in the optical, you're looking at old stars. And uh, you can see that clearly in this galaxy here, where you'll see the UV, you're looking at star formation. So when you want star formation, UV is what you do, looking at hot, bright stars. And, uh, yeah, okay. These other ones didn't seem to come through, but that's okay. This is, finally, this is a planetary observation again in the UV. This is from STIS, the Space Telescope. And here, what you're looking at is the aurora on Jupiter, but this is EO. So you can see the aurora follows EO, Reason for that, of course, is EO is, has these sulfur volcanoes pumping out lots of ions into the, into the Jovian atmosphere, and, and that's what you see. So let me, uh, let me end, end there. Yeah. So let's thank Professor Jain Murthy. <laughs> and now, if you have questions, maybe two, three questions we will allow. So raise your hand. Yes, go ahead. Hello. Uh, sir, can you explain like uh, how UV polarimetry will be different from optical? Maybe if someone tries in the future. Yeah, there, <clears throat> for, for good reason, there have been no UV polarimeters except for WUPI, the Wisconsin Ultraviolet Polarimetric Experiment. And uh, there, I, I don't know how you do it. I don't even know how you do optical polarimetry. I, I, I don't understand it. And so I try my best to stay as far away from it as possible. But the trouble, the main problem in doing polarimetry in the UV is in your calibration. Because uh, uh, you have to worry about in, the intrinsic calibration of your instrument. And in order to calibrate in the UV, you need all these special chambers. You need to do it in a vacuum and so on. So that gets difficult. So the, as I said, the only UV polarimeter I know is Whoopi, 
and that only did for bright stars. So, not, but the techniques don't really change. So, next question. If no more questions, let's thank Professor Murthy once again. And